Hey, good morning, church. It's so good to have you here with us today. We are gathering in the name of Jesus Christ. He is our Savior. He is our friend. He is the one who is for us. He is the one who is with us. His name is Emmanuel, and we gather together to worship him. I am so happy to welcome you to our church. I am Pastor Dwayne, the Connections Pastor, and we are glad you are here. As we begin this morning, we're going to take time to worship our Lord together. That means we're going to sing. We are going to pray, we're going to look at God's word, we're going to just uh, in, enjoy the fellowship that we can have in the Holy Spirit together. So welcome, I hope that you're comfortable, you've got your coffee, you've got your spot, um, perhaps during the week when you're listening to this, you're going to be in a car or something like that, driving down, overhearing this, uh, just audibly, but uh, whatever it is, we are glad you're tuning into our church today, and I want you, want, want you to know that God loves you so much, so thank you for being here. I want to begin with this question today, just taking us down memory lane. If you grew up in a, in a church, you maybe participated in a youth group, and this question comes from a magazine called Relevant, and they ask on Twitter, what is the most ridiculous youth group game that you played when you grew up? What is the most ridiculous youth group game that you played when you were growing up? Now, um, if you didn't grow up in a youth group, maybe you have no idea what we're talking about, but a youth group is... a, a a social group that happens at a church and we draw people every week just to talk about Jesus. But one of the things that we tend to do back then was we played a lot of games and some of those games um, were legendary. So maybe you want to share with us what you did, but talk about that with some people at home or post some ideas in our in our chat group at live.hbc.info or you can even share some of those ideas on YouTube this morning if you want to do that. We are glad you're here with us. Um, you can also let us know that you're here watching. If it's your first time, this is super important. Head over to our connect form from live.h or sort of hbc.info and find the connect form there. Uh, fill that in. We want to we want to be able to welcome you. Someone's going to follow up with you this week. It'll be someone from my team. Sometimes it's even me, and we'll just talk to you and, and find out where you're from. Just uh, want to send you a coffee card and say thank you for coming. If you've been with our church forever and you thought, well, I don't need to do that anymore, you still do. We want to know you've been watching with us. We want to know you're still here. So send us a hello and send in a prayer request and we'll pray for you. Today, if you need prayer, you can um, head it over to uh, live.hbc.info and you can click the prayer button and uh, someone will pray with you today. It's so good to be able to get prayer. There are many things happening in our world that require God's help and we need to ask him. We need to be thankful that he hears our prayers. We need to be thankful that he invites us to pray and we get to pray together. So uh, check in with our, our prayer host today and we'll be able to pray with you, able to lead you to God, find some comfort there. Uh, I see lots of people on our live stream today. I wanna say hello to a number of you. Carol's there, Duff's, Joel, Roger, Kristen, Kim, Steph, Victor, Tony, Deb, Brenda, those are the ones that I can see. The Gettys family is here. Charitine, Terry Codling, Mark. It's so good to see you all, Trish. So glad you guys could be here. Um, let me just tell you something that was great for me growing up. I got to be a youth pastor. I love that. And we did play a lot of games. Um, maybe you never did, but some of the games we played were just absolutely crazy. Uh, every time we used food, it was probably in the wrong way. Uh, but one of the things we did to kind of make games more exciting is that we would play a lot of games in the dark. I mean, one of the times I got to go to this church, I went to the church, it was my first time in the building. They turned off all the lights and they told us to play a version of Tag. That is crazy. But some of these games were ridiculous. But we did all of this so that we could attract youth and give them a chance to meet Jesus Christ. And that's what we want to do today. We want you to come and meet Jesus Christ with us. We are going to be back in our series today in Revelation. I hope that you've been reading through that. We're in chapter one. The next section of verses is coming up. So that means it's time for church. So get your coffee, get set, hope you've got your Bible, and get ready to sing because it's time for. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to church, everyone. Have you got your coffee? Do we have some tea drinkers in the house? Only Todd, yeah, I thought so. It's so good to see everyone. So um, just want to say welcome. If you are a first time guest, we would love to get to meet you if you're here today. If you're on the live stream, you can just uh, let us know in the chat. 
And uh, if you are here after the service, we would love to meet you in Guest Central and just give something. So welcome to you. And then um, the big C, like I said, coffee. I'm joking. Connect form. Everyone, this is the way we want to stay connected to you, but also this is a way that we grow spiritually with you and that we, um, that we stay in touch. So if you don't mind, we would love for you to fill out the connect form. It's, uh, it's just for us and for you to grow together. So please consider doing that. Uh, baptism orientation, that is happening on the 7th of April. If you need more info, hbc.info is the way to go. Please go look at it if you need more info. Then we have Easter coming up, which we are really excited about. So we have Good Friday. Yes, amen. We have Good Friday, which is happening at 9 and 11. We need you um, to go register for that. And for Easter Sunday, we have three services from 7, 9, and 11. Now, very important to know, for the 7 o'clock service, I say this more to the men, but also to the ladies. The secret word is free food. Okay? Free food is going to happen at the 7 o'clock service. So if you want to come a bit earlier, come and enjoy the service with us. Um, please, you have to register for that. Very important. We also have a food run happening. So on Easter Sunday, if uh, you feel in your heart you want to contribute to that, um, please bring non-perishable foods. We are a church that wants to bless the community around us. So please, if, uh, if you're willing to do so, please bring that. And on Easter Sunday, we're just going to gather it together over there. Now, before we go into uh, praise and worship, you can stand with me so long as I read the following. And it's from Romans 12. It says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to Him. And this is the part. This is your true and proper worship. So as we come, we just lay ourselves at God's feet every day. We give our whole being, and not because of what we have done. It clearly says because of God's mercies. And so we come today, and we just lay at His feet, and we're going to sing together all we want and all we need is found in you. Amen? Let's sing.
matter what we face, we can sing this. And in your presence, we are made whole. When the world has no answers, we sing. And in your presence, there is freedom. Can you sing this with me? And in your presence, we are made whole. All we want and all we need is found in you. It's found in you.
been strong you came to us and set your heart upon the cross we'll never know the sacrifice you made no we won't all our sin and all our shame you took the nails and took our place no one else could do what you have done it's no one else one name is higher one name is stronger than any grave than any throne christ exalted over all from the grave where dead would die you rose again and brought us life you're reigning now the savior of the world you're reigning now the savior of the world one name is higher one name is stronger than any grave than any throne christ exalted over all the only savior to you alone our praise belongs Christ exalted over all we'll sing your praise we'll sing your praise we sing your praise forever and lift your name we lift your name Jesus Father, we exalt your son, and I'm so thankful right now for how church, how being in a service like this just takes my eyes off myself, takes my eyes off the problems that I'm aware of in the world, Lord. And it, uh, it makes me aware, more aware of you, more aware of your son, more aware of the exalted Christ and and Lord, that's where we need to be when we come to worship. Father, we need to have a focus on you to momentarily take our eyes off this world, which is fleeting, as troubling as it can be, as frustrating as it can be, with all the pleasures that are in it. It's temporary, and you invite us in worship to look at you the eternal one, and to take our perspective from you. So God, we exalt you. We want you to be high. We want you to be lifted up. We want you to be the number one in our hearts, Lord, that we might be your people, and that might change the way we interact with this world, and today it might change how we interact with each other. So God, right now as we live in a world where there's lots of turmoil and uncertainty, I pray that we would 
have a service where your people are gathered with the certainty of your love. Father, where there's peace between us, where we offer that, not because we have everything worked out, Lord, but because you've worked out so much for us. Lord, I pray that we would offer each other forgiveness long before we've even sinned against each other. And that, Lord, when it's time uh, to show that, God, you would help us just to work that out in love. God, we are frail people. We're fragile people. Lord, I love that lyric that says, bring your addictions, God. Yes, there are many things that we name as addictions, but Lord, we all love our sin. We return to it. And um, God, we ask that you would give us relief from these things, change our hearts. God, as we look in your word, we ask that you remind us of every precious promise, promises to heal, promises to change, promises to save, promises to lead us as we surrender to you. God, we need all of that today. God, I know people among us are praying, praying for healing. There are people in their families that are hurting and sick, little ones that need care, older ones that just need hope and, and direction and, and medical assistance, Lord, for our own bodies, that, that we need them to be there so we can go and, and make money for our families and do the things that people have asked us to do. So God, we need you to keep us strong. Father, we need you to advance your ministry. Lord, we can't do it on our own. We limp along walking behind you. Lord, that's great for our humility, but we need your power. We need you to fill us today with your Holy Spirit that we might have something to give to this world that's different, not just our very best, Lord, because it's still just human, but something that comes from you that people would long for, that it would cause transformation, that it would plant a seed of the gospel in their heart that they might grow up and turn around and turn away from sin to follow you, God. So God, would you give us that to pour out into this world? Father, as we take this time to look in your word, I pray you just watch over your servants that have prepared this day, Lord, those that are serving in every area of our ministry, and of course, Pastor Todd, as he opens your word. God, would you speak to us now from it? Wherever we are, at home, in this room, throughout the week, may we remember that your word is powerful, but it's the one thing in this world that can change anything. So God, we come to you and ask you to speak into our lives. We trust you with our lives. We give them to you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks, Pastor Dwayne. Thanks, Edu and team. Good morning, church. Good morning, All right, let's reach for our Bibles, uh, Revelation chapter 1. And as you're doing that, I want you to think for a moment about something that is... Uh, awesome in your life, uh, something that you have that you would say, you know, that's an awesome thing uh, that I have in my life right now. Uh, it might be something like um, uh, children. Having children is an awesome thing. Most days. Most days, that's an awesome thing. Uh, grandchildren. <laughs> Amen, Clem. Bimpy, your new grandchild's here today. That's an awesome thing, right? That's an awesome thing. The grandchildren are way better than children, way more awesome <laughs> than children, I can say for a fact. Friends are awesome. A job can be awesome. House that you own can be awesome in some ways. Some experience that you had, you know, we went to Banff last year. I didn't, but I'm just saying. I went to Banff and I saw the mountains and they were awesome. Went on this trip, we did this thing, we looked at the night sky, all of these, you know, awesome things that have been in our lives, and we should have no issue with any of those answers. Uh, they are awesome uh, gifts uh, from God that he gives to us. God made uh, the universe, God gave us life, and he gave us all of this that we would um, enjoy it. But I wonder, even as we were thinking about all of these awesome things, I wonder how many of the more spiritually minded people in the room said Jesus. You know, they said Jesus. Jesus is, is awesome. If you thought of Jesus himself, some probably did. And he is awesome. I have no trouble using the word in all these other contexts, but he is awesome in the best sense of the word. Amen? He's awesome in the best sense of the word. And though we have 
of these, with these scriptural descriptions of Jesus in our hands as we read the scriptures. And though we know the gospel story enough to realize this fact about him, we can still fall so short of actually understanding the true awesomeness of Jesus. It's actually a very hard thing to get our hearts and minds around. And these next verses in Revelation 1 take us there as best they can, given the limitations of language, given the limitations of the 1900 years that have passed since John had these visions, given the fact that this was John's vision, John's experience, and not ours, and he's just trying to describe it to us. Despite all of that, we have in this passage a description of Jesus that is awesome and should excite us to the very depth of our souls. And in doing that, it should also call us to something greater wherever you happen to be right now in your walk with Jesus, hopefully being confronted by the awesomeness of Jesus. You want something even better than what you have right now that the awesomeness of Jesus would actually do that for us. So let me read these verses, um, and then uh, we're going to get right into it. Um, this is Revelation 1, 9 through 20, the end of the chapter. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a fire. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. And in his right hand, he held seven stars. And from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Is that awesome? <laughs> Like, what a passage. Uh, the awesomeness of Jesus is what we want to talk about in your notes and on the screen. The awesomeness of Jesus, first of all, meets me where I am. The vision uh, that John has opens very personally. He has this vision, he's writing it down, and he opens it up in verse 9, saying to the reader, saying to you and to me, I, John, your brother and partner. He uses... Uh, the family imagery, which is really common in the church. We refer to each other as brothers and sisters. Uh, he also uses that of being partners in this common enterprise to reach the world with the gospel. But then he goes further to mention the deep connection they share because of their mutual difficulties in fulfilling this mission that Jesus had given to them. They're connected. Notice what he says here. Now, three things that he mentions, they're connected in the tribulation. You see there in verse nine and in the kingdom and in the patient endurance that are in Jesus. Now, this connection that they had as partners, this connection around these three things was necessary because of the persecution that they were all experiencing as they were attempting to build the kingdom of God and this community on earth that God had given to them called the church. 
And I read, I, I thought about this, and I thought about this, this phrase that maybe you've heard before, the power of shared experiences. Have you heard that before? The power of shared experiences. Did a little Google search on that. Lots of articles, lots of people who have talked about the benefits, the power in our lives of sharing certain experiences together. There are social benefits to sharing in, in experiences together. There are relational benefits of going through difficult, challenging times together. Maybe you've experienced this as a family. Maybe you've experienced this in your workplace relationships. You've uh, experienced this through working with a nonprofit or through friendship. Even as trivial as it sounds, uh, people who are part of teams, uh, sports teams, and they go through difficult seasons together and they come out the other side, they have this power of a shared experience. Certainly those, we watch the reports on television, but those who have gone through war, those who have survived um, uh, those who have survived natural disasters, those who have, have uh, survived tragedies. I, I think I never like to use any illustrations related to the city of Boston. It has to do with sports. I don't like any of their teams, but I just remember in the wake of the bombing at the, at the marathon, Boston strong, and the city of Boston rose up together against the great evil that happened during that uh, wonderful um, sporting event that's held every year. And they had the power of shared experience. And it bound them together with even stronger bonds. And that's what John's tapping into when he shares this. These early Christians had shared the experience of persecution as they were building what John Stott calls a God's new society. And that's what the church is. It's a new society that is built into the existing society. And because of that persecution, it made their relationships deep and abiding. John's tapping into that. And we think about this, this, this tribulation that he mentions here that they're going through. It's so important to say this, Fanning, one of the commentators I'm using through this series, this is what he says. This tribulation is not merely the annoying problems of life in an imperfect world. How many people here had some annoying problem of life in an imperfect world this week? Anybody? Okay. What's wrong with the rest of you that didn't raise your hands? Because for sure you had some annoying... How many people had an annoying problem this week? Thank you. Back to Fanning. The tri this tribulation in, in Revelation, what John's talking about, is not merely the annoying problems of life in an imperfect world. It is the trouble that Christians encounter because of their allegiance to Christ in a world that is against him. That's what genuine persecution is. That's what John was experiencing. That's what the people he's writing to were experiencing. And God's purpose in all of this seems clear in the first century, in the first decades of trying to build a church that's going to spread around the entire world as it has today. Those first decades needed to be filled with this shared experience of persecution so that it would be as strong as it could be as it established a beachhead in a world that was hostile toward it. It needed, we look at the persecution and say, it's so terrible and all these Christians died in such horrific ways. But the persecution was necessary. They needed the shared experience to be as strong as they possibly could be. Well, then he goes on to say, notice he was on the island of Patmos, mentioned that last week on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. In other words, the mission I was carrying out to preach, sharing the testimony of Jesus, telling people the gospel, that's the reason why I'm here. Not because I'm on some mission here. It's a rock. There's hardly anybody that lives here. I've been put here in exile as a result of the gospel work I was doing. Now, here's what I find super interesting about that. He's not bitter about it. He's, he, there's no indication here that he's angry about the fact that you could say it this way, God has benched him. Put him in a place where there really aren't any people to hear the gospel. And yet this is John who had served the Lord faithfully throughout his life. Pretty much everyone agrees John was the youngest of the 12. He may have been a teenager or at least 20 years old, at the very most 20 years old when he was walking with Jesus. 
That was around uh, when, by the time Jesus died, he, he was, it was the uh, early 30s AD, but now we're talking about, we're into the mid to late 90s when this letter is being written, so tax 60 years onto his life. We're talking about a man now who at the very least is in his 80s and probably in his 90s, has faithfully served Jesus, and he finds himself in a very lonely and desolate place. Is that the reward that an apostle gets for faithfully serving God? You get pushed off into nowhere land where there are no people? He's not bitter about it. He's set aside by circumstances, but let's be honest, he's not set aside by circumstances. We believe in a sovereign God who's in charge of everything. God put him there. God could have chosen something different for him. God could have said, oh man, he's a guy in his 90s. Why don't we just pop him in a nice church and have that church love on him and they can care for him and they can esteem him as the apostle that he is? No. Let's put him on Patmos. Let's put him on a rock in the midst of the sea. John's not bitter. He's not angry at God for putting him there. Now, I don't, I don't know about you, but I want to say that I really struggle with this. The least amount of pressure that gets put on to the good thing that I have going on in my life, and I start to get angry about it. can set me off. All of a sudden, my prayer changes. No longer is it, thank you, God, for all the awesome things I do have in my life, but all of a sudden, like, I'm praying, oh, woe is me. All of a sudden, I'm praying, hey, God, what's up with this? You pray that kind of prayer? The slightest little thing comes into your life to upset the awesome things that are already given to you, and you're like, what's up with that, God? Don't you know who I am? Don't you know what I've done for you? Aren't I serving you faithfully? Why are you making it so hard for me, God? Why aren't you blessing me in the way that I think you should? Seriously, Todd? Because we're talking about me here, right? Seriously, Todd? Do you think you're hard done by? Then that rebuke only gets magnified when I start to consider the plight of people who really do have hard things happening in their lives. Shut up, Todd. You want to say it to me? Do you want to say it with your own name and stuff? Accept the place that God has you. John did. Again, it seems that John fully accepted his situation and wasn't bitter or angry about it. Notice he's still spending time with Jesus. Verse 10 says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Now, the Lord's day is Sunday, and, and he was spending time evidently with the Lord, meditating on the word, praying, perhaps worshiping with God's people, whoever happened to be there. And, and by, by saying that he was in the Spirit, he's saying the Spirit of God came upon him. The Spirit of God filled him. And so with this great attitude that he still has, I serve God faithfully, but I'm in this place, and God has me here, and I'm not going to be bitter, and I'm going to still spend time with him. John happens to be in a place where God can still use him. God's still working through him. So he says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, verse 10 continues, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. It's not a trumpet, it's like a trumpet. It, it's a metaphor, or more correctly, a simile. He's doing the best he can to describe this booming voice that he hears behind him as he's spending time with the Lord. Verse 11 saying, write what you see. Here's what the voice says, write what you see in a book. I'm about to show you something. I want you to write it down. He's been given this mission 
more on that later. He used to write it down in a book, and then he used to send it to the seven churches. How many people like maps? I like maps, so we're going to look at one because I like them. You wonder about the seven churches. Why did he pick these ones? There were other cities that were actually um, more influential cities, bigger cities uh, at the time. Uh, if Ephesus was uh, a major city close to the seaport of Miletus. Uh, but if you start at Ephesus and the order that we receive the seven letters, you start at Ephesus and you go counterclockwise up to Smyrna, then to Pergamos, and all the way down to Laodicea, it forms a circuit. It was actually a mail circuit, like a postal circuit that would be followed by couriers. And so it made sense that these seven would be chosen because they were part of a, they were part of a mail route. And, um, and so that's why we have these seven churches. We're going to look at those. That's the content for the next seven messages. In fact, we're going to look at each of the seven uh, letters that are sent to the seven uh, churches. The point is this, the awesomeness of Jesus, and we're going to see this in a moment, um, met, Jesus, met John where he was. He was on Patmos. He was writing to seven real churches in seven real cities that were part of a postal route in um, what is called uh, Turkey today, modern-day Turkey or Asia Minor. God met John where he was, old, in exile, seemingly out of the game, but none of us is ever out of the game. While we're still breathing on this earth, none of us is ever out of the game. No one, no one, Jesus is going to meet you where you are today. No one is ever too sinful to be forgiven. No one, no one is, is ever uh, too rebellious to not uh, surrender to Jesus now. No one has a story that is too awful to turn around. No one is so deep into it that they cannot be pulled up and out. God will use you. And he'll meet you right where you are. Only have your heart ready for his work. Only be ready for his will to be accomplished in your life. Be prepared to have the Spirit fill you, empower you, come upon you. Be in the Spirit as John was. Stay close to him. Be ready for the call when it comes. Set aside your excuses. There are a thousand excuses for every one of us. Set them aside and respond with joy to the fact that God has a plan for you, for your life, a plan to use you to accomplish something great or something small for his purposes, for his kingdom. And, and, I, and I say great and small, but I don't know the difference between the two. Because in God's kingdom, seemingly small things end up being awesome and incredible and huge. And some of the great things that we think are great are really so very small. All right, so that's the first part of the awesomeness of Jesus. Uh, the awesomeness of Jesus meets me where I am. And then secondly, uh, the awesomeness of Jesus stops me in my tracks. John was stopped in his tracks. God often stops people right in their tracks. Whatever they think they were doing, God shows up and it ends on that day and something new happens. And he describes for us the scene of what happens next, verse 12. He says, I turned, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. So he does not immediately see the one who is speaking, but he sees these lampstands. The lampstands are not the lamps themselves. They're the stands. There's a lot of Old Testament allusion here. Um, a lot of pictures of what lampstands are in the Old Testament. We're not going to go into all of that. But we're told in verse 20 that these seven lampstands are the seven churches that are going to receive this letter, these letters. He continues, verse 13, and in the midst of the lampstands, lampstands, now he sees Jesus, in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man. That phrase causes a lot of confusion for people. The language comes straight out of Daniel chapter 7, in fact, so it's an Old Testament expression, the son of man. And what it means is human-like. 
So this image that he sees is a human-like image. He sees it, and he knows instinctively, immediately he knows, this is God. Like, I'm looking at God. But God is appearing to him in human form. He looks like a human, son of man. That's the phrasing. And so this phrase points not to Jesus' humanity as is often taught, often thought when we're reading through the Gospels because this was Jesus' favorite expression for himself. The Son of Man came, Jesus would say, referring to himself. It does not refer to Jesus' humanity. It actually refers to his divinity. In other words, I'm God, but I look like a human. I'm God in human form. It's a, it's a phrase that points to the incarnation of Jesus Christ, of God coming in flesh and dwelling amongst us. The expression goes on, or the description goes on here. He says, in the midst of the land stand, one like a son of man, clothed. Now, I want to say this before we get into these descriptions. The descriptions are metaphors. They're John's best attempt to describe what he's seeing. The temptation would be there. I think we have eight descriptors of Jesus here that John is giving to us, and the temptation would be that I need to lock down exactly what this means, and that this represents this, and this represents this, and that's not the point of it at all. I remember three decades plus ago, sitting in seminary classroom and listening to a professor who's a, a good friend, a professor and a mentor in my life, and him saying the point of reading the apocalyptic literature is not that we would uh, break down every single symbol in detail and find out what it represents, but it is that we would read it and be overwhelmed by it. It's like standing at the ocean and having an ocean wave pour over you and overwhelm you. It's meant to just overwhelm us. It's meant, these images are meant to point us again to the awesomeness of who Jesus Christ is. And so that, as we read this description, that's what we want to understand. It's meant to overwhelm our senses and increase our awe of him. So here we go. I'll start again. The Son of Man clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. Now jot down if you're taking notes here. This is, this, again, Daniel chapter 7, verse 9. This is a description of the ancient of days. You hear some of the very same descriptors. And so what we have going on here, this description of what John is seeing, this is a description of the ancient of days from Daniel 7, which is so obviously God. So what we have here, because we know this is Jesus, what we have here is a reinforcing of the fact that Jesus Christ is God. This is a picture of his divinity. He's seeing God, the Son of God, in his glory. Notice his eyes were like a flame of fire. They're not literally a flame of fire. If someone takes this description and tries to draw it out, you're going to have flames coming out of Jesus' eyes. It just becomes a little silly. Well, they were like. It's a descriptor. John's doing his best to describe it. So, like, I think about the pictures of Jesus. Immediately, I started going through this, and I started thinking all these pictures of Jesus that we see, right? Remember this one? Like, this is, like, probably the most famous picture of Jesus, right? That's not it. Then, I, then how about this one? No, that's not it. And this last one, this is definitely not it. Because I don't know who that Jesus is, and he's way too white. That's not Jesus. All these crazy pictures of Jesus. Verse 15, his, his feet, this is, this is what we're seeing. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a fire. His voice was like the roar of many waters. And all of this is meant to show the awesomeness and the overwhelming power of the one being described. This is establishing in the introduction to the vision. This is establishing the authority of the one speaking. This is God dictating the word of God, a revelation to the apostle that we are reading now. And we should be in awe of it. 
In his right hand, he held seven stars, which we'll see in verse 20, are the angels or messengers of the seven churches. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. Love that imagery. Again, it's not that a literal sword is coming out of his mouth. Think of the armor of God passage in Ephesians 6, uh, 17, where uh, we're to take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Or I think of one of my favorite verses, Hebrews 4, 12, that the Word of God is, is uh, living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. This is the Word of God that's coming out of Jesus' mouth, and it appears as a sword. And by the way, this is setting up the fulfillment of Isaiah 11, 4. The judgment is coming. The vindication of God is coming upon the earth. Justice is being meted out in the world. And then notice that his face was like the sun shining in full strength, which we all know will burn your eyes out if you look at it. How would you respond to such a vision? If you saw it, is it fair to say that you would be terrified? The presence of God as John described it? How did John respond? It stopped him in his tracks as it should stop us in our tracks. I I fear, honestly... I fear for anyone right now who's hearing these words, who's hearing the word of God and has a ho-hum attitude about this. Because this is evoking something deep inside all of us. John says, verse 17, when I saw him, I don't know about you, but I fell at his feet as though dead. If that's John's reaction to the vision, how could we possibly be ho-hum about this? John wasn't the only one who had this kind of experience. Moses had a very similar experience. Paul had a very similar experience seeing the visions of eternity. And Isaiah had this experience when he in Isaiah 6 was, was ushered into the very throne room of God and he said, woe is me for I am lost. The word lost means undone. I'm I'm coming apart at the seams. I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm a sinner. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. I live with sinners. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah saw what John saw, what Paul saw what Moses got a glimpse of. Do you have any sense of that in your life? A sense of the awesomeness of Christ? Does Jesus move the needle at all for you? Does the thought of him cause excitement Fear, awe. I get it. Everything in our lives wars against us getting to this place where we can appreciate and understand the awe of God. Your own flesh makes it hard. Your flesh wars against you being in the presence of God and understanding his awesomeness. The evil one himself is waging a spiritual warfare that undermines all of us living this out. And then there's the world system. Please understand, Christian, if you're a genuine follower of Christ and you have the Holy Spirit indwelling you, the world hates you. It does not love you. The world system does not have your best interests at heart. It doesn't. It hates you. When you walk out from this place, the safety of this new society that we're seeking to build, when you walk out of here and off the parking lot, everything hates you. You may not say it in those words. 
They're super subtle in how they communicate it, but they hate you. And what the world does to pull you away from any experience of the transcendence of God and His awesomeness, is it just, all it does is it just throws little distractions out there for you. A thousand little things that are going to pull your attention away. We love, we love the technology. We love in this day and age all of the, the, the technological progress that we've made and, and how all of these things are, this is what we tell ourselves, all of these things are making our life simpler. We believe that. Smart TVs, smart homes. Some of you can tell your home how warm you want it to be right now, right from here. Some of you can, can look on your phones and see who's ringing your doorbell at home right now. With smart homes and smart TVs, and computers, and the internet, and social media, our phones. But this progress, more often than not, is simply increasing the distractions that keep us from the awe of God. The sort of progress we're making only means progressing further from God and deeper into distraction. Here's a thought. Look at Jesus the way you look at your phone. Look at Jesus the way you look at your phone. So John, in this moment of feeling like he's a dead man, and he just faced the blazing beauty of Christ. He's, he's down on his face. He, he feels like he's dead. He's having the Isaiah experience. But Jesus laid, notice in the text, but Jesus laid his right hand on me. That's the hand of strength. Sorry, lefties. He laid his right hand on me saying, fear not. John, you don't need to be afraid because you belong to me. Um, there are people who need to be afraid, John, but you're not one of them. He assures him, I'm the, I'm the first and the last. I'm the, I'm the alpha and the omega. We've already heard that last week. I'm the alpha and the omega. I'm the beginning and the last. I'm the, uh, last. I'm the, be I'm the, I'm the beginning and the end of all things. He's saying, I'm God. Then he says, verse 18, I'm the living one. And here's where he tells him that I'm Jesus, the Jesus you walked with for three years as a disciple. He says, I'm the living one. I, I died, I, and behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. I'm, I'm Jesus. I'm the one who went to the cross. You were there, John. You saw me. You were standing with my mom. You saw me when I was resurrected in the upper room. Death has no more hold on me, you know that. Death has no more hold on anyone who believes in me. He lifts him up and gives him that assurance. Having walked through all of that, don't you think that's awesome? Are you capturing just a small sense of the awesomeness of Jesus Christ, we should all be stopped in our tracks at what we've just heard from God's Word. Well, the awesomeness of Jesus meets me where I am. It stops me in my tracks. And then thirdly, finally this, it determines the course of my life. John is told uh, what his specific task is uh, to be. Verse 19, he says, write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. And in this, in this phrase, in verse 19, we actually have a threefold division that shows us a breakdown of the literary approach to the book. In other words, the structure of how he's going to write this book, but not only that, how we're going to read it and interpret it. We can see it simply as this. Um, 
think we had a little chart. The literary approach to the book of Revelation. Uh, chapter 1 is the, again, these are phrases right out of verse 19, the things that you have seen. That's exactly what we're seeing right now is John's having this vision of the Son of Man and he's describing it, so that's why he's written it down, the things that he has seen in real time. Then chapters two and three, those that are, these are the things that are happening in an ongoing way. I'm gonna write to these seven churches about the condition, the state of the church now. And then from chapters four through 22, the things that are to take place after this. Now, the challenge with that, it's a very simple breakdown. It seems to make sense. A lot of commentators would agree that this is a good breakdown for the book, and I would agree this is a good breakdown for the book as it's described here in verse 19. But then we also looked last week at how we interpret these prophecies when we see that some of these prophecies look like they've already been fulfilled or they're being fulfilled now or they yet have a future fulfillment. And all of that is consistent with what we see in Old Testament prophecies. That there are, in fact, we can look at a prophecy and go, well, I think that that was fulfilled, at least in part, that was fulfilled in the past or it's being fulfilled now, but it doesn't seem to be completely fulfilled. And the principle is that as we look at prophecies, there can be multiple fulfillments of a prophecy prior to the ultimate fulfillment of that prophecy. If the release date of a movie is July 17th, summer 2022, we're going to get multiple trailers of that movie leading up to that ultimate release of the movie. Or an artist, a musician might release little excerpts of a song or one song off of a, a, a CD release that's coming up, an album release that's coming. One song will get released. It's a little glimpse. It's a, it's a taste of what's coming when the album drops. And that's what we have in these partial fulfillments of Scripture. And so, and so we look at Revelation 2 and 3, for example, what we're going to look at over the next seven weeks is it's not simply about the seven churches in the first century on that postal route in, in Western Turkey. We know it's not just about those seven churches, but in fact, those seven churches are representative of the church today. And there are some very stirring challenging messages that we're going to hear in those letters for us as we read through what they were going through, their warnings, their exhortations for us. And so as we work through the book of Revelation, we'll be asking the question, what is it about this verse? What is it about this passage that where we see something that's already been fulfilled or something that is being fulfilled today, or we'll ask the question, or is there something here that will yet happen in the future? We'll be asking that of every passage we go through. And so really in this, John, and really the Holy Spirit, because this is inspired by the Spirit, is giving us the method of interpretation right here in the intro to the book so that we'll understand how to interpret the book. And in fact, he gives us a very specific interpretation of verse 20, one that I wish was a little bit more helpful, but it is partially helpful regarding the symbols that we saw earlier. The seven stars, he says, verse 20, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. The big problem here is we don't know what those angels are. We know that angel um, is a transliteration of, uh, the, of the Greek word angelos, so we translate it right into English as angel, right from the Greek. We know that in its core meaning, it means messenger, but then what does that mean? Is this an angel? Does every church have an angel? Do we have an angel? Does Harvest have an angel? Like, do we have like a spiritual angel who's like here at church today, just kind of looking out for things? I don't know. Maybe. It could be that. It could be that this is a reference to the pastor of the church. So I know you often think of me this way, but I'm like an angel. <laughs> or it could be something else. It might not be that. We're just not sure. The seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. That's super clear. We know that. But he calls all of this a mystery, and that uh, certainly is the, probably the most honest statement in all of Revelation, that this is a mystery, uh, something you would not otherwise know apart from it being revealed. Now, no one here, as we think about what our particular calling is, what our mission is, what we're going to do in the world, no one here is called to this kind of capital A apostle work that John was called to in writing Scripture. Nevertheless, John is modeling uh, what one commentator called, and I love these, these two phrases, John is modeling stunned astonishment 
and reverent submission. Stunned astonishment, and I could even say it this way, stunned astonishment that leads to reverent submission. And in that, we can imitate John completely. I can enter into stunned astonishment of the Son of Man as he's described in Revelation chapter 1, and then I can certainly reverently submit to his will for my life, and anybody can. So the question to the professing Christians who are hearing my voice just now is, is this, is the awesomeness of Jesus Christ determining the course of your life? See, Jesus can't just be an add-on. Jesus is not an upgrade to the base software. Jesus is not a hobby. Jesus is not a slice of the pie chart of the priorities of your life. Jesus is like no other. We've heard three times already that everything starts and ends with him, that he is the first and the last, verse 17, verse 4, verse 8 from last week's message. We read this stunning description that John has provided for us, and, and, and does, this, does this description sound like someone who's okay with you having him as a side chick? That's the right way to use that expression, right? Jesus isn't your side chick. So listen, the course of your life determined by Jesus, the course of your time, the course of your finances, the course of your career choice, the choice of your friendships, the choice of your priorities, the choice where you live is completely under the direction of Jesus Christ and no one else. When you think about how awesome it is to serve the awesome Savior of the world, none of these other things should matter anyway. If you really enter into the awesomeness of who Jesus is and you understand what John is describing here, you just go like, my job doesn't really matter that much. How much money I have in my bank account or my time, like that I want it for myself, all of that just kind of pales and falls to the side in the light of the awesomeness of who Jesus Christ really is. All of these things are going to fall away as unimportant. And beyond that, uninteresting. Money just becomes so less interesting in the light of the awesomeness of Jesus Christ. My career becomes so much less interesting in the light of the awesomeness of Jesus Christ. Even my friendships become less interesting in the light of the awesomeness of Jesus Christ. The awesomeness of Jesus having seized and determined the course of our lives changes everything. And so for your sake, I hope that's what you want. I hope that that's what you're pursuing. I hope that you're seeking after with every fiber of who you are, I hope you're seeking after the awesomeness of Jesus Christ. Let me pray for us. Father, I do uh, pray uh, with gratitude again for your word. And uh, Father, there's no doubt that um, there's great frailty in human language. It falls so far short of the, of the mark when it comes to describing these things for John to have described what he saw, for me to now describe what John saw. Father, we know how, fall, how, how far short that falls. And so, God, that's why we need your Holy Spirit to stir inside of us, to help us to understand and grasp these things. I pray, God, that you would be altering our lives in radical ways, that you would shake off our rebellion and our complacency and our laziness. You would shake off, Father, our desire for more in this life, more temporal things. Father, help us to shake off the distractions and to see only you. Continue this work in us. Father, be patient with us. 
so very need. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey, if it's okay as we close in worship today, we're going to jump ahead three chapters into Revelation chapter 4 and uh, worship the Lord with this song. So let's stand together and worship him. singing. <laughs> Seeing Jesus changes things. That line, I saw Jesus and I fell as though dead. I was thinking about that and what it would be like to behold a vision or when we see Christ, that the worship that would come from us would be naturally, Lord, my life belongs to you. That's what you draw out of me. And I just wonder, church, have you had a vision of Jesus Christ? Have you been watching other things as Pastor Todd asked us. And those things are not causing us to worship. They're not causing us to bring our, ourselves in line with what Christ wants us to do. I hope that as you go, 
this week, you'll remember these verses. You'll be thinking about Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, in this amazing way, and it will change you. Perhaps that's something you need to pray about today. Before you leave, there'll be some people up at the front. You can come here. You can pray with them. Begin to get a new vision of Jesus Christ. If you've been changed today, we want to hear about that. Let us know that you've come to the Lord. Tell someone before you leave. I'm going to be out in Guest Central afterwards. If it's your first time, please stop by there. I have a coffee card to, to give to you and just to get to know you a little bit better. And we want you to have a great week in the Lord. And as you go, remember that you are loved.